Hi everyone and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails News Social. I am Madeline and I have the absolute privilege and pleasure of being your MC today for a conversation between two great poets, Anne Waldman and Kyle DeCrean. Um, I just have a few quick notes before I let Kyle and Anne take it away. Uh, we will be recording this meeting for the Rail Archive, so if you would prefer not to be seen, you can disable your camera by pressing the stop video button in the bottom left corner of your screen. Also, uh, please feel free to eat your lunch during this event. We know it's that time of day for many people um, and no worries about interfering with lunch sounds. We're going to keep the audience on mute until question time, which I'll kick off towards the end of the conversation. Uh, if you do have questions while Kyle and Anne are speaking, please write them in the chat bar to your right um, and then I'll get to you at around 1.45. If you also wanna take a moment to introduce yourself and where you're tuning in from in the chat, that would be fantastic. Uh, the rail team will be helping out with tech if you have any questions so feel free to message anyone with a sort of brooklyn rail tag under their name um, and closed captions are available you can turn them on at the bottom of your screen uh, special thanks to virtual label for sponsoring today's talk uh, and now to introduce today's host kyle uh, kyle is the executive director of the much beloved poetry project um, a place i know many of us who are tuning in today hold dearly. He's also a poet, translator, and performer. His writing can be found very widely, uh, but most recently in Ambit, The Offing, and Social Text. And he's also had recent performance pieces at Fringe Arts and Arts Nova. Uh, Kyle, I'll let you take it away to introduce Anne. Thank you. I'm so happy to be sharing time with everyone today and to see so many friends in Zoom and to be talking with Anne, whose birthday it was this past month. Um, Anne Waldman's work spans poetry, performance, teaching, editing, curation, activism, spiritual, feminist, ecological, and infrastructural practice. Um, she's connected to the lineages of Whitman and Ginsburg, the Beats, the New York School, and Black Mountain, and reaches into further uncharted territories through her combination of documentation, inquiry, myth, and incantation. Anne is the author of more than 40 books, including most recently Sanctuary, published with Spite and Dival Press, as well as Trickster Feminism, released in 2018 with Penguin, and the three books which comprise her monumental anti-war feminist epic, The Iovis Trilogy. She is a founder of both the Poetry Project at St. Mark's and the Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics at Naropa, where she continues to serve as artistic director. This past month, in collaboration with a number of musicians and other co-conspirators, Lori Anderson, William Parker, Ambrose Bai, and Devin Braja Waldman among them, and released an album, Siamaki, and I thought we could begin this conversation uh, by talking about that. Anne and I are going to touch on a few words that feel, for me, like they've been somewhere in the compass of her work. and so. I'd like to invite her now to share a poem that's a part of this album, Siamaki, and then to speak briefly about that word and how it's bearing upon this newest work for her. So welcome, Anne. Thank you so much. And I'm so happy to be here with you in conversation with the rail and happy to see the folks out there. So happy you can join us. So I'll just read a little bit from the opening uh, song, I don't know what to, poem, which has extraordinary uh, music and um, the overall title and concept is Siamaki, which is the uh, battle with the shadows. We'll talk about that. But this first piece is called Extinction Aria, as in the sixth extinction or the prophecy, Mayan prophecy, or the Buddhist sense of the wheel of time and life. And I'll, I'll just... Um, I'm very sorry not to have all the musicians in the space here. Extinction Aria, oh human, the contour of you is innocence, but because you make up things, you are dangerous ever in incantation. Your aggregate, porous, ahistorical, don't get it, don't get it, ridding the world of all but you. Humble objects, where are they? Everywhere in the landscape, you notice? Go be looking, that tree which is an ash, sit down under the walking trees and want to have legs in ink and want to be my own portrait, a full portrait. Ink will tell it all, light 
and shade, nuance of the hymn, a bee in the eye in the ear of the human, the starling in the beak of the human, how talk to the wind and come to God. If the warmonger is inventing a battle cry, he, always he, is ready to go, and he thinks, I am a g -g -g god I am a g -g -g god I am a god You will know this by an easy slogan. Words will be cheap. I am a god It's words that are signaling assemblages that have power. If a warmonger is insisting in surprising himself, he's then turning to the mirror of himself to worship himself, and then turning if he seems to trace an enemy. He needs to do this. He will. It is what he is doing. An imprint for the cycle, for the habit. This is the apparati of becoming. Enemy is the creation of a warring god realm. And that's just part of it, but. Here's a flavor, thank you. So that, you know, taking on the warring god realm, which is one of the realms in the, you know, sort of Buddhist image of the wheel of life. And the, the warring god realm always has to create an enemy because it gives you all this juice to exist. And so uh, that's what we wanted to touch on in this opening piece which gets very there are other voices coming in uh, so on how has um how has thinking about warring gods opened up um reflection that you're doing in this album around the present moment more broadly what's in the what's in the terrain of gods at war that you're thinking about right now well, there's so much, so much uh, layering. I mean, it's what we've been experiencing the last, say, four years. It's what we've been experiencing with uh, protests at Rocky Flats, not far away from here, where I stay in Boulder. It's uh, layers of, you know, accretions of karma, our whole relationship to, um, you know, our own culpability in all this. The own, you know, how are we being human how are we now you know we're we're distanced and so on and we've been dangerous to other animals we've been dangerous to our own planet as humans and we've been cruel and so in a way i'm, I'm not talking about a you know a, a theistic punishment but it's interesting that we're in this situation where we can't touch and we've been so uh, violent and aggressive. So that's interesting to me because in a way, the, bat the battle with the shadow is a battle with your own mind, with your own consciousness, with your own projections. And we're in that all the time. And here we are in this space, this aporia of uncertainty, of negative capability. We have to sit with the contradictions daily because it's shifting, it's very slippery. And this is a very slippery enemy, if you wanna call the virus an enemy um, and it's uh, you know it's messing with our, our 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 minds our psychology and then there are literal enemies <laughs> you know people who are uh, genocidal who are willing to let other people go we're, let, we're we're so exposed in terms of the whole capitalist scene in terms of the greed and cruelty and the way um, everything has been handled the ignorance the uh, intentional ignorance sometimes this flip-flop and not having any wise, any wisdom really ruling at the time, so-called time. And, you know, I keep wondering where are the, you know, the people who can really speak to this in a uh, historical way, in a spiritual way, in a scientific way, et cetera. And I've been investigating some of the other plagues of, <laughs> and it's not so different. You know, you think of the Roman empire and things really shifting historically uh, Christianity came into the picture sort of as a result of the, of the plague in that period. And that went on for quite a while. There have been year-long plagues. There have been five-year plagues, seven-year plagues. Uh, certainly those of us who, who lived through the AIDS crisis, which took, you know, something like 35 million lives worldwide. I mean, that was very recent. That's very recent in my historical memory and losing so many friends and so on. So we're, uh, you know, we don't have to reinvent a wheel, but we have to reinvent a, a way to be in, uh, you know, to reclaim some kind of humanity, a way to be to, to help 
others to do no harm. That's the mantra. So I guess, you know, a lot of the work of the recent work I've been doing is, um, you know, and infected, inflected uh, by this. And also it's a meditation on what our, you know, there's Foucault's idea, the last resistance I have is my body. And so when your body is so uh, vulnerable, how do you work with that? And so I, you know, the last resistance I have is my consciousness, <laughs> you know, something like that, which from some points of view has, has, you know, continues to have some kind of efficacy. But we have to turn, I think we have to think about how to nourish, bring things back in balance. We need more of the feminine principle. We need more, you know, wiser leaders. We need, it's a huge struggle. I don't know if we're, we're going to make it, frankly. And then, you know, climate, all that's, all that's so, it's been on hold, so to speak, everything. There's so many areas and there's so many um, areas in our larger world, how to, how to really interact. We have to have some kind of social fabric the fact that UN is, is so unempowered, there's no world organization. I mean, these institutional things that depend on money. I mean, we're seeing this, the, the whole fallacy, all the things that have come up in these political uh, differing viewpoints of how to live, how to take care of one another, how to be, um, everybody should have healthcare, this business of it you know, being tied to jobs. We're pay, facing a huge, huge, huge shift, I think that uh, and so many more people will suffer and die and homelessness, we're all kind of, you know, have to feel that empathy the, the, and the, the migrant uh, situation, the, you know, what this will cause, so much upheaval to come, I think. So there's the battles with your own, you know, you start with yourself, what, how, how can you extend um, to other and through the work I've, you know, I've felt informed by many things, by many of my, you know, fellow comrades in collaboration by leaders, but you know, people I've worked with in activist protests, those memories of what, you know, what the struggle has been with the Mary Baraka, with Ginsburg, with Daniel Ellsberg, you know, with the work we've had to do out here in Colorado and the work in New York and all those ways we've been in public space and out in the street and so on. And that's, you know, we have to think very skillfully on how to how to continue because we're in a real bind here. Everything you're saying is making me think about what is the particular importance and necessity of language making work and and poetry specifically to identify and disrupt and provide new means through crisis and. I sort of locate a lot of that around the word project. I think about what is, what is, the, what is the word project every day? And I know that um, there are other poetry organizations that are the foundation or the academy or the society, but the, the work that we have in common is the poetry project. And that came out of um, a, a federal arts grant to support specific arts projects at the church. But, I want to know what this word has meant to you over time and how you're thinking about it today relative to, to poetry. What's, what feels to you like the, what are the projects right now and what, what are the, what's the utility and trajectory of, of poetry inside this moment that's containing, as you're pointing out, so many radial and interconnected um, crises? Yeah. No, it's very tentacular, you know, if I can use that word. I like to think we're close to the cephalopods who have an incredible intelligence and they can also be sort of trickster-like, but project as, as in project, I always like to raise that when, you know, we talk about the poetry project because we were instigating, you know, this extraordinary oral tradition of the, the you know, the public readings several times a week and you've continued that in this brilliant way. So the, the idea of project is a, a, you know, a noun, these projects, I have a zillion of projects I can, I'm able to work sort of simultaneously and the, you know, the, the things that are in the world that are very physical, that are involved with infrastructure and so on. And then the sense of projecting then, projecting the voice, entering public space, 
Um, and one goes to projective verse, which is of course the, you know, the incredible Olson um, poetic screed and letter, you know, evolving out of letters with Creeley and others, but that's 1950. And uh, Williams was very interested in that, but this sense of um, propulsion, the, um, you know, what is it? The, the heart by the way of the breath and the um, head by the way of the syllable, one thing following instanter on the other. And it was a, a breakthrough form in terms of, you know, composition by field and, and uh, not, not working so much with inherited forms, received forms, breaking away from sort of English traditional left side margin forms. So that sense of um, an active, of almost bodily experience and what is the psychophysical situation that we're in and, and sort of also proprioception, which is the body's, um, you know, balance and gesture in the world. So, you know, that's very interesting right now. How are we relating to our bodies? It's very different when you're masked and you go out and you have your gloves and you're very wary and your eyes are sort of scanning everything and you're, um, I mean, unless you're on the other side of this and feel, you know, more liberated. So are you less liberated? Are you more liberated? You're more alert, awake and alert like an animal. So the projects are, I would say right now for me, um, some work in Mexico where my son and his partner who's Mexican are living. They just had a um, baby girl, Cora. Cora with a K as in Cora in hell as Cora, the daughter of Demeter and so on. So uh, I, I'm hoping to get down there soon, they're, they're struggling as well. It's fraught everywhere. But that sense of working exchange, culture exchange with um, others, there's some a wonderful, uh, the Decenari magazine, these events, these various projects and festivals and working in a woman's prison down there. We've made two visits to that and thinking of them in this moment, thinking of the women in that prison, it's very um, visceral having been there recently. Um, so these projects that work with uh, language because we're doing poetry workshops and we're, we're so uh, in terrible shape with the discord, the, the political discourse, let's call it that, or the debasement of language. How do we talk about this trauma that we're in these last years? How do we talk about some, uh, you know, a le the leadership that degrades language? So poetry has to work in this other kind of magic. It has to be in touch with, you know, imagination, with, um, combination, recombination, and we can't just be repeating the same sort of uh, iterations or the same tropes and so on. And, and our, you know, our own advancement in terms of gender, identity, uh, your breakthroughs, you know, with uh, racial politics. I mean, that's been one of the hardest things is the white supremacy that's running this show here in our um, uh, country. It's, I mean, I'm gonna start crying about, about how intense that is and that, that so many things that have not been uh, addressed and healed and, and brought to you know, justice. And, and so anyway, dealing with that, the layers of that, the language around that, that we could be in a Zoom meeting and be attacked by you know, white supremacists coming into this kind of space. So what is this space where you know, the last project I have is my body with my projecting voice into public space with, you know, projects of these recent books. I mean, Trickster Feminism was all about uh, being out in the street. I was writing things as, you know, we were protesting on Fifth Avenue, uh, the women's marches, this and that, you know, really coming into the work and, and this Franco Harris sense of meditations and emergency. So those meditations become actual as you describe and notate and document and then take it, you know, you're following your dreams as well. You're trying to dream the end of war. Uh, Bernadette Mayer, whose birthday is today, had a workshop at the Poetry Project years ago where what the assignment was to dream the end of war. So those kinds of things that poets can do, uh, even in this more distant situations, I think. I mean, I'm constantly engaged with other um, writers across these divides and hoping there's a skillful means through through the technology that actually can have us meet mind to mind and have us uh, engage to create you know structures alliances spaces it's so important still to hold physical space for things we don't know where 
things are headed, but we can't cede control of everything so that it's, you know, we have no ground. So I think of, you know, Fred Moten's The Undercommons with uh, Harney's, that, you know, amazing book, which talks about a sort of a new kind of prophetic, uh, uh, you know, commons, a prophetic commons or the prophetic institute or the, the you know, how we have to work with our own um, uh, prophecy and our own projections. We constantly, pro that's the other sense of projection, projection projecting onto things. And we do that in a very negative way and think the worst or get lost in, you know, extremism of, um, I mean, I think there's some very valid conspiracy, right? I mean, there's, there's factual <laughs> conspiracy, but the point is not to get, not to let our minds get lost in this and that, but as, po as artists, poets, to keep our sense perceptions awake, alive, healthy, in, in communication, in conversation, I mean, I, that's what I miss, not being with, you know, a lot of people is the discourse, the conversation, you know, worrying something, arguing, seeing it through or planning, you know, creating something together that is an alliance and is creating a, a whole movement, if you will, a whole way to um, actually create a psychic shield to be in this time. So the, la it's so precious, the language that we have to keep, you know, we have to keep enriching that uh, that facility that I mean it's part of my proprioception although usually that word is used in a you know more learn the animal languages and that's so important that the these languages of in our world and culture survive so many things are going down as we know evaporating and have to be held at the same time that you've always been really attuned to the formal and spatial vision inside of a poem and text, that it, it strikes me that that's always been parallel as well to your work imagining social fabric and person to person infrastructure and different kinds of community formations at the project, at Naropa, otherwise. And so I wanna to come to that, these words rhizome and infrastructure, which I know are also very locative and important for you. And, and ask, um, you know, in this moment where we're, where we're building, we're building infrastructure through uncertainty uh, as we kind of go along, what are, what are you, what are you feeling um, optimistic and fearful and attentive to? The other day we were talking about, you know, the, some of the, the problems of, um, this increasing reliance on screen to screen connection. And so I'm wondering what, what do you think, um, what is the work that poetry and poems can do to facilitate other sorts of social infrastructure and connection that are not screen based and surveilled and- and Repathy. Yeah. Repathy. <laughs> Lepathy, dream work, shared dream work. I mean, you know, there's certain cultures that have, have similar dreams. They have, a, you know, based on entheogens and so on. But I wanted to say a, a vision I had on, um, you know, this is back in Berkeley, the Berkeley Poetry Conference, when I couldn't get across the bridge because I was on this um, lysergic acid experience, but a vision of everybody you had this for everybody you've ever known and you start with your family and your immediate you know relatives and so on and all that and what history you have and ancestors and everybody you know and then all you know all from all ages and times and so on and then you're all sort of in this great vision together this kind of kingdom or whatever queendom and you're all kind of looking up and what you know, what is it about what are we here for how do we connect and that but there's always has to be your enemy over your shoulder. And that actually is uh, an early sort of Buddhist practice when you're kind of entering ta tantric practice where you, you visualize everybody you've ever known and the vision that everybody was once your own mother or father, et cetera. And you also have to take the enemy. So I guess there's some, and so the enemy is something you have to really um, work with. And you have the, you know, the rhizome, which is a tuber system and which the, you know, great partnership of Deleuze Guattari took into you know, it's their book on um, schizophrenia and capitalism. 
a thousand plateaus, but they take that uh, and, and move from the more uh, linear or the more, um, you know, vertical tree of life, you know, the roots growing that way. The rhizome is horizontal and you can enter at any time. That's the kind of magic of it. So it's very liberating. You don't have to come in at the very beginning and you don't have to be sort of uh, as a poet, you know, restricted in any way. There's no dominant uh, sort of goal or, or um, you could say the canon, you know, it really questions the canon and they look into that in terms of philosophy and critical work. So there's, there, you can enter in media race, you know, in the middle of things. And that's how I started the, the Yovis trilogy. I, I was at a certain age, I'd had a child and I was entering in media race. And so I could go backwards, I could go forwards. And that's um, been liberating as a way to think about, you know, these, these structures, how to, there's the book, you know, All Poets Welcome, which is about the poetry project, how you can come in at any point, it's good in the middle, it's good at the beginning, it's good at the end, it's, you know, anywhere along. So it's a different kind of trajectory. And it's also, again, not working with uh, received form. And so it's not, and, and the sense of the energy you know, this kind of intensity of the clusters in the middle is always excited me and the way you can come in. So that image of, um, which, you know, Quest challenges a lot of our, you know, preconceived idea of how one has to work and accomplish and moving always upward, some kind of ladder. It's a very different mode. I don't know if that gets to the question, but I think in the poetry itself, there's that idea of not knowing exactly where you're going and, um, there's the story of Ashbery always having to take a walk around the block before he even had a title or he'd come back with a title. You know, just the kinds of uh, practices we have and rituals we have and ways of meandering, um, you know, me meandering with the mind. And then the, the running can be a um, echo of that or a shadow of that and so on. Um, I guess the bigger, you know, the bigger way we can work together is being, I think, um, transparent in our, you know, it's not always this business of, is it factual? Is it this? Is it that? But our, our documentation is very important. And our documentation is through our gaze in this body that is a, is a kind of project, is a, a tentacular thing going on with all the sense perceptions, with all the um, things that, you know, we're informed. Poets are avid readers. We're always reading. We're always, um, investigating our own you know relationship to text from all back, way way back and into the future i mean it's just that it, it's food it's nourishment so there's that that's also added to all this you know a sense of the of the continuum and that's uh very precious especially as people go out of this world and pass and that's been going on in my with me with my generation and, and younger now um how, how we can hold in, you know, this kind of immortal memory the, through the work. And then the work also grows and changes. And, and um, you know, I've been looking at things that seem to be very prescient about where we are now because of the, you know, investigations of what is my body? What is my gender? What is my identity? What is my, um, you know, where does this poetic so-called voice come from? Is it from the heart? Is it from the head? Is it from the ear? Is it from, you know, a, a dream I had? I had a dream where my shoulder was opened and things would be poured into it. <laughs> so I thought, maybe that's where it comes from. This was poured in at some interesting place. What was your actual question? <laughs> that's, I mean, this is totally in response. I was just asking about how you're conceiving of rhizome and infrastructure. And I hadn't at all anticipated that you were going to respond temporally, thinking about rhizome as, as, um, as a, a temporal model for, for experiencing some kind of out of time connection to both the future and the ancestral and the dead. And um, I'm, I'm appreciative that you, that you, put it in those terms because I'm also thinking about the importance of, of epic in your work and the ambition of, of epic experiences of time through language. Mm -hmm. um, maybe something that you said that I, I hadn't um, 
that I hadn't sort of outlined in advance of this conversation, but that is really occurring to me now is as you return to talking about the body and um, the self in relation is, is how do these tentacular journeys through time shift your perspective of self in relation to other and and poet self and and self and and community that you're situated within how how is that how's that shifting around well when i wrote i started uh the trilogy the epic trilogy and epic as you know telling the story of your time of your tribe of your language of your culture of your history of the wars of the heroes and the and so on the uh, the battles um, and I was writing it for my son who was I think just a few years you know five years old when it began and thinking also of his generation to somehow talk about this time we were in it seems so um, you know exciting in terms of the, the what I was experiencing uh, you know growing up in the village the, the company I had the amazing um, you know, beauties of the work of artists and poets of my time and generation and, and feeling so inspired by that, that we, you know, we, it was like this golden age also with all the horrible criminality and war and torture and genocide and the whole history of this, our continent, et cetera, and trying to be attentive to that as well. But uh, something, there were some victories in terms of, you know, that have not been uh, fully uh, achieved around civil rights, around gender rights, women's, you know, et cetera, all the movements that one has been involved with. And so that, that was uh, so encouraging and empowering, empowering. And when, you know, when Allen Ginsberg was dying, he was saying to me, we didn't do it. You know, we weren't, we didn't do enough. We hadn't this and that. He was seeing ways that he got sidetracked and he didn't realize how deep the uh, enemy was. <laughs> so, so the, the idea of the, epic is this thing over time and you know Coleridge talks about that you need 20 years you need 10 years to to study all the mineralogy and the science and the language and the culture and the history and so on and and where you are just in your own reality and then there's five years for composition which seemed very fast to me that seems a little speedy and then five years for correction so anyway that was inspiring and then there's the you know, the wonderful Arnheim land realm of the uh, Australian Aborigines and their epics. If you look into their, you know, different cultures and their epics are a lot of, you know, similarities, but they actually, it's a, it's a meandering where you're out in the landscape and the, the uh, epic becomes the, the ground that you're on and your connection to, and you know, every inch of that way, you know, what grows here, where the little witchetty grubs are and, where the um, place where the watering hole is and so on. And you become, and it takes 40 years for your epic to evolve for your, and you, and you, you train in that as a way, in a way. So that in terms of a span of time, I wanted my epic to be a, a kind of container, a little time bomb. I mean, I was having, you know, relationships to the past, looking at other epics of the past, and then also my time, my tribe, my battles, et cetera. And also, um, layering it because it's very much a montage from other places and cultures, a lot of travel. And there's this, you know, character kind of moving through with dreams and consciousness and heartbreak and so on. So I think poetry is a way of catching that the shift and the, you know, the sense of the continuum as uh, comrades and com com uh, you know, what do I call them? Colleagues, <laughs> cohorts uh, pass out of the, you know, out of this, they're part, you know, you enter this continuum and as I was saying earlier, you sort of in a new way and inhabit that and it just gets richer. It gets richer for me and I feel, you know, even uh, more connected. And so part of it is not to let that, I mean, if anything, this is maybe one of the tasks of, of us to, you know, our archive, leaving little threads, little wisps, little hints of, of something of, you know, a beautiful, some phrase, some line of poetry that can be um, picked up on. It can be like, you know, they talk about terma, you know, the hidden treasures and you find, you see a cloud uh, pattern or you see the, you know, the uh, um, crotch of a tree and that leads to a whole, you know, a dream, a poem, a vision. 
so that sense of leaving little things behind if we can you know maybe we'll be completely you know burnt to a cinder here but something i for me it was so important to hear the voice of um uh, you know, Mayakovsky, to hear the voice of Antonin Artaud, to have a little bit of tape of these characters, and then, you know, hearing Gertrude Stein, you know, for the first time, and so on. So that sense of the the breath, the heart, and so on, that's contained in the in the uh, oral thing, which you can hear. I hear so many of the poets I've known in my head. They're in my head. They're in this kind of um, holy space. Um, but the I'm not sure in terms of I feel like I've always been doing the same things and it, it, even more so it's what is there to do I just have to do what I know how to do somewhat and continue um, as best I can trying to work with all the new information and also trying not to get unseated with the you know these contrasts and and uh, absolutes and binaries I mean we really have to work outside these binaries and the divisiveness of that um, so, and how to do that with the, the work itself. And when I worked on Sanctuary, this is coming after Trickster Feminism, which are very large, sort of ambitious pieces in Trickster Feminism. One of them, Face Down Girls, on the album with Deb Googe, um, and, it, you know, a shortened version because these are longer texts, but they, you know, they had to have a kind of space that went beyond the street and went, and anyway, into a, a future time, if you will because I feel like some of this is thinking about that. And also we have to take care of these archives that we've been so involved with. Um, yeah, I wanna talk about memory too. Mem memory as it relates to archive, but memory as it relates to memorial and the, the work of public and communal memory. Um, you've said to me in correspondence before that you feel like you're often bearing sad news and it's true that I do hear of many poet passings from you. Um, it seems like we're sort of constantly living through a season of dying, but dying is happening in a very different and particular way right now. Um, and I just think of you because you've been so much a part of different memorials that we've organized. And because I think of your, your work both poetically and infrastructurally as really connected to memory. And so I want to know how, how you think about this relationship between poetry and memory and passage, not just in the, um, not in, not just in the broader cultural sense, but in the, in the really specific sense of how and why poetry is important to particular communities. Why do people, why do we, why do we gather around poetry when passing happens and how does passing inflect the ways that we gather around poetry poetry is the oldest religion it predates religion there's no you know in any human culture and you know even uh, neanderthal you could say in terms of certain rituals and things that have come up around uh, actual language and sound we don't know exactly but it's 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 kind of uh so embedded in our, I think, in our consciousness, in our memory, in our genetic flow. It's uh, organic. We, I, you know, some are more naturally drawn to it. And, and I think of it as a way of, um, of keeping, you know, something that there are so many different views of how spirit might go and so on. And, you know, one can think of a lot of ways and particular kinds of ceremony Etc. One one worries because of all these people passing now in our land, and not having those ceremonies, not even able to, to be with their friends and relatives, to be to have a goodbye that's not on a cell phone, etc. So that becomes very uh, power, you know, sort of moving. How do one? How does one think about that? And I think that's why meditation is important. You know, visualizing the person, remembering their voice. When uh, Mitty was Baraka was. Uh, last at Naropi talked about uh, don't let them die. He said to me, don't let them die, Anne. You know, don't let this stuff, keep it unburied. You know, don't, the little voice of Charlie Olson or, you know, he was very generous. You know, there's a long list of poets that should be included in, uh, you know, not not dying. And um, so, so you do have, you, you do have the work, you do have the, um, I think, 
again, we, uh, when poets die, you want to, you want to kind of uh, honor that. It's sort of a blessing to honor that. It's a gift in a way to honor that, you know, rather than seeing it as a duty. And we joked about, you know, the, being a director at the project, you're also this funeral director because people have to, and then the joke was, you have to schedule your memorial now. <laughs> you know, I'm going to schedule my memorial now because, you know, it's stacking it. So trying to keep a, you know, a balance with, without, being, you know, morbid and, and we have to mourn, we have to collapse. But the language of the, the, the person who's passed is like so active in, the, in, the, uh, in, in one's uh, consciousness and ear and eye. And there's, there's a shock always of, you know, what it means. And then you have this incredible memory. Um, uh, Clark Coolidge always goes to the basement and gets all the, you know, works of the person and just, in, embeds himself in that for days. Um, one one does that. One immediately goes to the the poetry of the of that person. Yeah. And it was hard. I heard from Michael McClure's widow. She was she was um, you know alone with him, but he was surrounded by books and art and music, all these things that he loved. So there were still these these um, you know archives, so to speak. But beyond that beyond that. So I'm confident that this is a way we can com communicate. It will evolve. I think um, we have to be very protective of, of, of these continuums, you know, continue to be attentive and work to preserve because we don't want things to just, you know, things will die and go away out of our time and culture. But it's, and, and one thinks of how um, we're gonna work with education younger people, children, you know, I'm thinking about my granddaughter in Mexico City, will probably will grow up there. Um, how can, you know, that the arts and all that we've been engaged with, how can that have a, a role in her, what she would know? This has been a problem in our culture, not having these things, having these endless, you know, battles over cuts in programs, um, Arts, the music can go, the arts can go, the poetry can go. Not, not realizing these are are uh, part of our part of our being. I believe so. You know, it takes different forms. Yeah, you're really reminding me that um, when we remember, our attention is turned towards the the really total way that someone was living, which we maybe exactly. couldn't we couldn't be we couldn't perceive um in in life it's sort of at the moment of death and gathering that we we are able to kind of apprehend this whole this whole apparatus of of knowledge and spirit and language um so now i want to turn on on that note of memory i want to turn to a video that you collaborated around with no land which i understand to be dedicated to marianne faithful who is Living. Well, she's living. She survived uh, yeah. COVID. I haven't been in touch with her directly, but with some of her extended family, and and that was, you know, amazing. My last uh, kind of, you know, sort of email with Hal Wilner was around Marianne's situation. She was in London in the hospital, and then Hal himself, and I, it was like three days before he died, was quite sick with complications with COVID, and so that was a shock because uh, I hadn't realized how serious it was. And so there was some uh, archival material here, some photographs of Alan's when Hal had been at Naropa and with Marianne, and then a recording of Marianne reading a poem of mine, and then there were images of her. We got her, uh, Nolan did a brilliant job of you know, finding the Ophelia footage and um, other things come into it, and then her own brilliant photography. So it's about four minutes and dedicated to Hal, who died on April 6th. And I see it extending to other friends who've passed since then. Um, just yeah. a kind of way that we could, you know, she and I could collaborate over this distance and create something that was trying to, you know, capture this, some of the essence of these beings. Amazing, uh, if we are ready to go, I will share my screen with the video right now. Does that sound good, guys? Yes. Great, thank you. Yes, so let me just wait. This is um, John Keats's negative capability, uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, direct quote. 
It's not, hmm. I don't know why it's not playing. Sorry, everyone. Um, Madeline, try clicking the X on that little pop up in the right corner of the upload live stream. I think it might be blocking you. Yeah. Okay. Like Stephen Taylor, another collaborator. Um, I think something weird might be happening with my computer, everyone. Um, I'm very sorry about this, but Sophia, can I message you? Can I message you this link, Sophia? Yeah, sounds great. I'm ready. Sorry, everyone. Uh, technical, technical problem. Did you get it? Sorry, I'm just gonna put that work? Sorry, everyone. No worries. <laughs> worries. <laughs> yes, I received that. Okay, I'm about to do it. Screen share. <laughs> Thank you. and fear. Hopes and fears, you have them. You had them. Hopes and fears, you have them. You had them. Hopes, you have them. Fears. Hopes or fears, you had them. You have them. Hopes and fears, you have them. I won't say no. You have them. I will say it plainly, you had them, I had them. Hopes and fears, I have them. Wake in the morning, fear, the clock, the day, I had it. Wake in the afternoon, fear, the clock, quiet, I had it, fear. The night, noise, the street, I have it. Person beating his body against a building. I saw it. Fear. He had it. She has it. Hopes and fears. You have them. All the bodies in the morning light. They have it. Wake in the morning. Fear. The clock. The day. Job. Another person was there. He had it. Wake in the afternoon. She was gone. He had it. Other men both had it. Fear, they have it. Two women had fear of being alone. She won't walk down the street alone or say goodbye. Then her friend needed to be talking constantly. They had it. Fear, the radio, the forecast, the debt.
habit, fear, what is it? Fear, who is it? so much of the work you do is just such a um, it's such a reminder of the ways that you braid together poetry and art making and friendship and um, you were saying earlier in the conversation that you feel like you continue to do the same things over and over again and I think it's because it's partly because your your manner of world building is just so so intuitive and so generous so thank so, you um, we have, I think, a few questions which um, Madeline has been helping to, to gather. So yes. I think in the last few minutes, we'll turn to those. <laughs> Apologies again, everyone, for the technical difficulties, but that was so lovely uh, to see. And Sophia, thanks for jumping in there. Um, so our first question is from Tristan. And Tristan, I'm going to unmute you right now. Hey, Tristan? can you hear me? Hey, Anne. Good to see Hi. you. Tuning in from Los Angeles. Lovely to see your home, which has so many fond shared memories uh, in Boulder. Um, my question, uh, I just, and actually it's, it's uh, nice that you uh, shared that film because I was wondering if you could expand upon sort of the concepts of hope and fear in light of uh, this pandemic time. And maybe uh, also another sort of, uh, theme that you invoke often in summer writing program from Hakim Bey, the temporary autonomous zone in this kind of time of so-called social distance. Um, so hope and fear and temporary autonomous zone relevance to our moment. It's so good to see you and I'm glad you're feeling better. Tristan's been through it. Thank you. And thank you for your beautiful work your installations and all the work with light and photography is so dear to my heart. Any case, uh, well, to the a temporary autonomous zone, which is what we're kind of in, uh, it's not an institution. It can be, you know, last a, a year, a week as Naropa, let's see, it's almost, um, it's over 50 years with the poetry project. It's probably 47 with the Kerouac School. So this idea of not having to build uh, an institution, a you know something that then becomes tired, worn, uh, uh, you know dogmatic and locked and sort of you know stuck in its time, uh, I think is really important. And we're we're in. I feel like I'm in many uh, temporary autonomous zones. We just don't know. You know the uncertainty is is profound. But the um, the sense of hope and fear is like a hot and cold shower, just flicker. It's your mind, this, that, this, that. So it's trying to capture that mental state, which is a kind of psionic -y. We were talking about that earlier, this shadow battle where you're, um, you know, completely sort of victimized and you can become paralyzed. And so you become paralyzed because you can't. And in a way, it's sort of, Gombin talks about one, one, one text about, the poet's job, the artist's job is to look into the, the, how you are contemporary with your time and how you are contemporary with your time is in this kind of paralysis in a way as things are, are so speeded up and going in which way to go, how to, how to turn. So acknowledging it, kind of bringing it out in the open, that uncertainty. And I love the images that Nolan comes up with because, you know, children in the streets and funerals and, gatherings and so on, what we're, we're missing and lacking, but there's also that distance in, the, in those situations. So it's all a new terrain in a way, but there are historical um, precedents for this. But the Agamben thing is about how we're looking. We have these, uh, you know, central 
in neurophysiology where we can see into darkness. So we're, the, the job of the poet is to look into the darkness and be contemporary with the time. And looking into the darkness, there's also this neuropsychology with the uh, actions of your eyes and mind that you actually see light. And you probably know more about this than I do. You actually see light in darkness. So mm -hmm. that can either leave you because in a way that, you know, it's an expanding universe and we're getting further away. The lights maybe, you know, as it's coming towards us, it's leaving us. So you're in this aporia of it's happened, it didn't happen, it hasn't happened yet, and so on. So it's a um, kind of meditation <laughs> in a way. And a way, and also trying to see it so you don't get totally lost and destroyed by it, by the conflict. Yeah, I think the technical term is phosphenes. So Phosph it's kind of a, those flashes that you see on your eye in the darkness. Uh, exactly, yeah, yeah, phosphenes. So to invoke that, and an image for me is, I don't know if you know Bal Balinese theater and dance, there's the... Um, one of the masked figures who comes out of out of the inner uh, shrine to the out, you know, entering the marketplace, coming into public space, mm -hmm. and they're in this what's called a chandi bentar, which is a gate which ha is open at the top, and it's the entrance way, sort of from the secret uh, temple into the you know public space, and the figure will stay there sometimes for like a half an hour or an hour doing this kind of Balinese, you know, beautiful hand mudras, trembling, mm -hmm. and in this state of complete paralysis waiting and then finally makes the step across the threshold out rather than the threshold in so that's hmm. always been very powerful me for me because you you know and this is a time ritually when you bring the, the little idols out of their secret cabinets and you you know their little shrines and you bring them out and you there's sort of this median place where which is like backstage and then you come out and into the marketplace, but there's this moment of transition. So that's what I'm feeling now with the uncertain, not knowing how long is this gonna go on. We're not gonna be back to normal in any way. This is a real shift of, of um, the planet, you know, the balance, the, the loss of life, the uh, incredible, uh, you know, environmental situation with all this migration, you know, people just being at the, at the ends of, of time in a way. And, in, and, you know, talking about project and vision and, and what, what are we projecting? What are all of us individually projecting as what this will be is interesting. You know, just thinking about that, how to work with that. That's, thank you for that question. Yeah, thank you, Anne. Um, and by the way, are we gonna be able to have any kind of uh, participation with summer writing program via virtual? I'm not sure yet. We're sort of designing it for the, our 30 core students who are our degree students. And we, we have this plan for our uh, Sanctuary and Apocalypse um, program that we designed with many, many people coming from all over uh, for next summer. We sort of put that on hold. We're partnering for a few days also with Harvard Divinity, the Center for World, you know, Study of World Religions. So that could not happen really virtually. We, I, we thought about how could we transfer this very ambitious program with you know, 50 some guest readers and performers and so on. How could we be in community together? And it just seemed too big at this point and to, and to have to figure that out like right away, it starts. And so this smaller program, I think we might uh, maybe coming to some of the um, lectures would be possible. We're looking into that, but thank you. You haven't had enough of Naropa, we need you representing, you have to be an avatar for me in the world with Naropa. The archive. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you, Tristan. Now we have a question slash comment from Patricia. Patricia, I'm gonna unmute you right now. Hi, hi, um, I'm uh, speaking from Brighton in uh, COVID times and um, um, I'm uh, very um, interested in interested in uh, the American uh, voice uh, in poetry, and um, I uh, had just recently been looking at some footage of uh, John Ashbery mm. uh, uh, later on in his life, and I just uh, uh, it was really close up, and you could see. Uh, the importance of play in his eyes 
and I feel, I don't know if Anne feels uh, this too, uh, that it is important uh, for us as poets to play um, uh, rather than to be stultified and stupefied by uh, the times. Yes, I think that's great. Thank you for bringing that into the conversation here. Uh, so much of my, you know, early love and coming, coming when I was out of school, just coming to St. Mark's Place and then totally getting involved with the, you know, it's just in my 20s, going out to the Berkeley Poetry Conference where uh, John had been invited but couldn't come and also Frank O'Hara and others, but um, Ted Berrigan was there and other poets of the, you know, younger generation, sort of representing in a way the playfulness of the so-called New York School and the, uh, you, you know, talk about the necessity for uh, holding our language and reclaiming what's been so uh, brought down in the, you know, the current discourses in, in the social political fabric, but that, that wonderful uh, leaps of, of uh, mind and imagination and wit and the juxtapositions, of course, of and John's beautiful work that's like a dream, but it's not necessarily, it's like the um, rise of not necessarily towards some particular goal. You're just in this space and in this mind and in this gaze. And um, you can be with you know, Daffy Duck in Hollywood. You can be, um, you know, in, in particular kinds of um, forms. I, I always go back to the tennis court oath, that book of his, which you must know, which is so yes. uh, wonderfully inventive. And just, oh, it opened when I first read, just opened up poetry in this enormous way for me and many others. And was so, you know, happy to know him and be able to honor him. And his, oh. we get a lovely memorial at St. Mark's uh, Church that I, Eileen helped organize and it, it it brought people together in the morning. It was actually a morning service rather than a late afternoon. So there was this uh, wonderful power of the, of the light in the morning in that, in that ritual. Yes, I'm so glad you're, you're, you're a fan. There's so much work to read by him. Yeah, but it's, it's not so much him. I'm, I'm, saying, I'm saying that to, uh, we work. must remember uh, to, to be playful, uh, that um, uh, we mustn't get stuck because uh, this is such, um, uh, like you're saying, that uh, it can lead to a paralysis. And uh, by leaping into play, whether with language, to see it as enabling us to turn COVID on its head, to turn mm -hmm. Trump on his head to tr turn the times mm -hmm. uh, significantly um, uh, um, into a country mode. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I, do you write yourself? I guess, yes, you I do. Yes, wonderful. Um, I think, you know, another thing was the, with John was the, um, you know, sense of, of uh, voyage, you know, voyage with him not knowing in there, you know, these kind of surrealist um, moments that con constantly were jolting you out of any sense of, of, of the relative world even. And um, he, could he could work with anything. I mean, his sources are always so interesting, you know, instruction manuals and things of yeah. the ordinary life. And I think also Joe Brainerd, who, um, we were recently sell his birthday and that, that connection, their collaborations together, some of his uh, visual work with John, John book of the Vermont notebook. Maybe you know that. Huh? So yes, the, the, um, yeah, power of that, of the, of the, um, playful and mm -hmm. kind of surface to not getting lost in mess and message. We have to save, Poets also poetry and the legacy from mess and message. I think that was one of Ted Berrigan's lines. You know, part of his job, he felt, was to continue that. You know, with his cut-up sonnets, not get too lost in uh, sort of 
the official verse culture world of you know the title saying it all and having to come away with a, a message or meaning or this was the, the the point is the experience of the language and sound and all the poeas yeah viva ashbury good yeah. <laughs> thank you Patricia and Anne, that was great to hear about. Um, next, we have a question from JC. JC, I am unmuting you now. Or if you can, you can. Yeah. yeah, I'm here. Hey, Anne. Hey, Kyle. Thank you so much for the conversation. Um, and Anne, thank you, thank you for your time. It's sort of uh, an impossible task to talk about everything you do in, in such a short hour. But I, w I want uh, I wanted to. 11 o'clock in the morning in Colorado. Well, then we have all day, don't we? <laughs> um, I was wondering if you could talk about a bit about your activism on the border um, and kind of what you get up to down there and whether it affects your poetry or just what, what it means to you. Well, last summer I took a trip when all the, you know, the horrors of the ICE uh, detention centers and the um, separating children from their parents. I mean, it seemed that was one of the most, um, you know, egregious things going. I mean, it just continues to get worse as we know. And they're actually, as we, conduct these, you know, conduct our lives, these uh, raids are continuing to go on, you know, rounding up people. But that, uh, that was really wonderful to be able to go down to El Paso. And, you know, we went to Clint, which was sort of in lockdown. Some of these uh, Congress people had been there uh, before that. Um, there was also earlier the uh, Aurora Detention Center in Colorado, where some of us visited. And I write about that in this book, Sanctuary. And my uh, daughter-in-law was uh, taking photos from that where we, you know, she's Mexican and we put up a Mexican flag was raised. And um, I had no idea. This is very close to where the Kerouac School is, where Rocky Flats is, <laughs> continues to be because there's still plutonium in the ground. But in any case, a thousand people are in there, children, men, women, children, and, and so on. So... That was a, a sort of wake up call. It was really good to see the activism on the ground. We were guests at the, um, Tongo Martin was down there. Um, we were guests of the agricultural workers site, which is right on the border of Mexico and El Paso. And so many, there were many speakers and then there were poets from uh, all around. And we had a, an all day trip getting there. We uh, sort of went through where Cheyenne Mountain is, where NORAD lives, you know, you know, meditating on the industrial military complex, on the role of NORAD in our, you know, uh, capitalist scene surveillance mode. You know that place, right? Cheyenne Mountain with the underground floors. This is the, the most powerful sort of military. This is what, when the time comes, you know, and the button has to be pushed. They're the first, first to go, first to be uh, responding to any kind of nuclear thing there. And they were, of course, on alert during 9-11. Any case, a lot of history there. You can check it out. So it was a journey through, um, I was thinking of Ed Dorn's poem, um, you know, his epic poem that takes you into, um, you know, these parts of truth and consequences. Uh, I was thinking of the Cokes in Wichita because they're characters in this kind of parable of Dorn's um, so I have a text called uh, Truth and Truth of Consequences, and you know I talk about um, university time of crisis, out of the way border station, the desert outside of El Paso became the epicenter of the outrage over Trump administration policy, uh, uh, policies, and so on. So we you know we were able to go document, uh, read poetry, meet other people on the ground there. And also the fact that the Agricultural Workers Project site is, uh, you know, activist in every way. It's not. It's not just an arts uh, center. And the artists, teachers, health workers there would don't believe the lies about the people. So despite talking about the people coming across the border, there was getting a lot. There was a lot of press on that. The idea of invasion. You know, these people are not. Thousands of people are not coming in. And please tell the world. And then we could see these tents across the border. And the citizens of the two countries crossing back and forth between this tunnel-like bridge covered with wire. And then we went out to Clint, which was, you know, there wasn't even a soul there. Inside, this is the place that had all the, you know, babies and you, can't, you couldn't hear anything. But just imagining 
the uh, you know the chaos and and pain in the inside that building it was amazing. So you know this business of how we are now in our invisible sort of. I mean, I can see where you are. You have this beautiful brown roof and so on, but we're in these separate, we're separated. And then this, this sense of being in lockdown, this is a very dangerous place for us to be because we're very, very vulnerable to another, other kinds of lockdown. Um, and that concerns me. And then the, yeah, so the border work is so important. And when Trump got in and his whole thing with Mexico and I was spending more time there, I'd, I'd been there in the sixties and through, you know, many decades, trying to get there when I could, but um, I took this vow I, and I was interviewed, I think the day I got to one of these at the Casa del Lago festivals, you know, what are you doing here? And so on. I said, I'm taking a vow. This is going to be a set, you know, my activism is to get below the border and defy this kind of Trump fatwa on the border. So that's continuing. And I'm trying as soon as things can lift a little, they're not letting people my age, uh, you know, leave the house in certain places. They're not letting them get on airplanes. Um, so I, you know, I'm just aching, aching to get back down there. That's amazing. Uh, you know, so stay tuned. I mean, if you're anywhere near detention centers, just know what's going on, try to find out what's going on inside, see the people who are the social workers around that, get information. There are people inside who are poets, <laughs> writers and artists and thinkers and activists themselves. Awesome. Thank you. You're, you're, I love the idea that it's the poet's job to tell, to tell these, to tell these things. Yeah, reminds me a, a bit. They're of, there to be told, and the and you can tell them in ways. Go to poetry for the news. I recommend that over many years of reading the news. <laughs> go to poetry for the news. Poetry is news. I love that. I love that so much. Poetry for the news. Um, thank you, JC. Thank you, Anne. And next, we have a question from Lauren. Lauren, I am unmuting you now. Hi, Anne. So lovely to see you. Hi, good to see you. Um, congratulations on your grandchild. And, uh, and the name Cora is something that I wanted to ask you a little bit more about in relationship to this moment in time. I've always been inspired by Plato's use of the term Cora uh, in the Republic to mm -hmm. talk that, that about that which is yet to emerge, that which we envision, being more real than the thing in itself. And so I wondered in this liminal place, we find ourselves how you would interpret um, Plato and the Republic um, mm. in this sense of suspension. Oh my, uh, it was a little hard on the poets. I don't know the part on the poets. Uh, but I, I, Cora is you know, the, exactly what you're saying, this thing from coming up from below and then of course the the notion of this child in my life coming at this time born on the equinox as well which is bringing light and coming up you know Cora in that in that myth of Persephone and so on is is um you know an underworld sort of princess coming coming up so that's very clear I'm not sure I've Go back to the heart of your question. I don't know how Plato is relating. I feel like I'm living in a cave. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'm living in a cave, and there are the shadows on the wall, which is the psionomy, you know, the battle with my own thing of hot and cold, hopes and fears. All yeah. I think, um, yeah, maybe I need to return to that text in a way, but the the sense of the cave or oh, the the skull being a kind of cave the skull being a sort of cavern the skull being yeah. a movie theater yeah <laughs> i also movie. think what you kind of i think just fell upon it with your visualization that the skull is also a vessel you know so long long after we're gone and we find skulls of our ancestors of course it's the absence of the brain the absence of all that we think of as thought um which uh is it's the void so i think the skull is a really good connecting point well, it's a relic it's like you know it's in the center of meditation you know maybe the ultimate it may be the ultimate um vessel for us to consider well thank you oh, like that. thank you uh thank you so much lauren it's great to see you here today um and for our last question we will go to fong uh fong i'm unmuting you now thank you Anne. Thank you. Kyle. 
been a very inspiring conversation and hearing um, the notion of reason and I couldn't help but think of my friend, I think he's doing okay, Silvia Lokshin J. When Silvia came to New York, you know, in the early 70s, he already had experienced terrific disillusionment, terrible disillusionment about how post Frankfurt School Marxism and American left, you know, had failed to generate a continuum that you were talking about in the late 60s. So by the 70s, it was so amazingly damaging because the idea is how we can materialize and encourage more fluid and rhythmic idea of power design developed by, as you mentioned, Gattari and Deleuze and Foucault and other people. Um, but I just don't remember how, for example, Isaiah Berlin, 1977, very famous essays called The Hitchhawks and the Fox, where it's supposed to be an intellectual game, but people took so seriously the idea of the hedgehog being someone who can do one thing doing well, and the fox can do many things to whom the world cannot boil down to one singular reading. And that became almost like a biblical permission for mm -hmm. people who go into the academy. In other words, you and the few poet we know, and he and there may be a teach here and there, but you never commit fully into the academy. Mm -hmm. Because you believe in a poet, you must be part of life out there, emerge in everything among human being activities, you know, in order to cultivate your poetic sensibility. So many poets we know, this, but particularly younger generation who study to become poets, mm -hmm. they, they, don't, they don't have that incredible firmament of that fluidity that, that Suvea spoke so much about, you know. So whatever the consequence of the mid 70s onward is that the academy went further into obscurity of language. The language get more unscootable. Yeah. Get even lost. It's unclear and it's really difficult. So where we are now is a good timing because we have been slowed down. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out what would be the potential coming together. I'm glad that you are here and I'm glad that Kai is here. The, the, the option that we can do anything together now is coming together. Right. And I think we need the wisdom of someone from your generation to connect with someone like Madeline, who is at MC today, mm -hmm. who's mm -hmm. gone to Columbia to become a poet in graduate school. Mm -hmm. So I want to be sure there's some kind of dialogue going mm -hmm. on and it can perhaps take place away from the academy. So my question is. Yeah, well, I think that, that does go on and I find a lot of, you know, there's the whole Reagan period. I mean, there's lots of reasons, uh, economically, poetically, the Vietnam War, I mean, so many reasons why, and it, this is not a united country. All these things have not been solved, uh, resolved, uh, come to, you know, justice and, and even within our own, um, our own psyches around it. And some of us have been, you know, quite privileged. I valued my education, but I couldn't wait to get back into the, you know, into the room with the, you know, more of the European style of the cafe, you know, sitting at the foot of teachers, going, seeking them out. And so I, you know, at an early age was able to start the magazine and also jump into the poetry project, have the world and just reaching out to people that way, going to traveling, being in touch with pe poets uh, across the country, the little bookstores, you know, these small things, a tape might be made, a little cassette tape that would travel amongst the poets. That was part of the education. And the project was like the perfect graduate school or any beyond that, you could start, it was like the Rhizome, you could start at the beginning, middle end, wherever you came in, you were welcome and you could evolve. I think the problem now is a career as a poet. I don't know that that is that going to be easy in these next times. What will that, I mean, I think the learning, the conversation, in a way academies have been havens because you have this borrowed time, you know, this time where you're, if you have a, you know, a scholarship, et cetera, and things are covered in graduate school and you have the conversation and it leads to, uh, you know, publishing and so on. There's a kind of track with that. That did not exist when I was 
coming of age as a poet. And I wasn't drawn to that. I mean, one of my teachers wanted me to do a Woodrow Wilson thing or try for this, or mm -hmm. this might be a move, but I couldn't, I had to be, uh, you know, in the streets of New York. Um, and also interacting with the other kinds of artists, the art and music scene world. That's what we also had in the 60s and 70s. We had this, and you could walk into, uh, you know, Alex Katz's loft. You could walk into Larry's, uh, uh, you know, just Jane Freilicher, go look at paintings, you, you know, studio visits. It was just part of your, your scene. You'd just wake up and you'd go to the Gem Spa, which I've had, I just heard has closed. The Gem Spa closed. You know, that's such a talismanic place at the times where you'd get your egg cream and meet up with people. It was a meeting place just on that corner. So uh, all that kind of hybrid activity and social and falling in love and I mean everything. The loft parties, uh, it seems like, yeah, the golden age. I remember when uh, Abby Hoffman had to go into hiding and he came back and then he came back with a plastic, you know, had, Done his, he was, he was, uh, had been under arrest and, and escaped and so on. But anyway, he showed up, it, it, may, it might have been a, a Jim Dine party or I can't remember who it was, but he was on the dance floor and I recognized his eyes and then we started dancing. And I thought, here's a wanted, you know, criminal, uh, wanted, you know, track, you know, on posters everywhere. What happened to Abby Hoffman? Here he is dancing at a, you know, an artist loft party. It was kind of interesting. <laughs> so that, that sense of the, the different worlds meeting high and low, high and low, and, and you know, you could be really uh, out there. So something has to, something changed in the social scene because it became more formal. I mean, my, my collaborations with visual artists like Pat were close friends, so that, and Kiki and so on, but it became more formal. You don't just drop in. You, you don't, you know, it's not that there isn't that kind of uh, company of friends, as Creeley would say, you know, the company of friends and you just, we could go out in the day and, and uh, wend your way, looking at the latest work, going into Joe Brainerd's loft and doing a collaboration, uh, et cetera. So why did that change? I think the economics of the art world or the, you know, kind of cat separate, separate things. I mean, it's, it'd be a very interesting study for somebody to do. I think in the poetry scene, because of the downtown St. Mark's being on the Lower East Side and the Lower East Side being such a hotbed and that being a place also where other people would come to events and, you know, people like Edwin Demby, you know, he didn't read there, uh, but he would come and to listen. And he, could, he always complained about the sound but he'd say it made you so much more attentive sometimes, the sound in the church. Um, in any case, yeah, I think the Vietnam War, I think the drain, the kind of uh, moral collapse in, within the, um, uh, you know, the, the country itself, um, how people were uh, treated in, I mean, there were so many other struggles around race, gender, et cetera all those things sort of simultaneously going on. I mean, the church was doing these benefits for Biafra. We would use St. George's. We, you know, there were lots of ways that we were more connected up to the, uh, the pulse of the civilization. So how that got, and I think the academic thing of you, this is your track, this is a career, this is what you do to be a poet. I mean, I think, I mean, I helped create our own school here the Kerouac School, but we didn't come out of a literature department. We didn't have that. We wasn't seen as a cash cow. You know, we could make, we had a literature program, but we could make money with this writing thing. And, and then suddenly there weren't enough, there aren't enough jobs. Who knows where it's headed now um, in terms of that being a secure career, a job with a tenure track and so on. So that's kind of exploded. It'll be interesting to see how it can re, uh, re orient. Um, I think the international thing is important, even though it's going to be harder to travel and people are not going to want to travel as much, but that's going to be an important part of, especially if we're coming to some kind of end of time um, or a new, you know, there could be a golden age, maybe a third of the planet is going to go. Uh, that's sort of some of the prophecies from these ancient wisdom traditions. Mm -hmm. um, lots of, you know, death and suffering, uh, nuclear, could be nuclear holocaust, uh, 
the migrant situation, immigration, all that people have being homeless, homeless. Oh, we're all going to be sort of homeless in some in some way, I think. So um, I don't know what we can do. I think I think poets will seek out other ways of of being in the. But you have to remember the economics. My I grew up in the city, and then my apartment was a hundred dollars a month. Mm -hmm. You know, back yeah. in the sixties. Um, I think it's going to take more alliances. I think it's going to take real commitment to say, what, I mean, it was a community project and I think the poetry project still is. They're interns, they're volunteers. I, you know, to build that, to build that internationally more, I think will be important. I know Kyle has a lot of extraordinary ideas about things to how to be in the world, uh, you know, as a citizen of poetry. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't sure that I, I understand, um, so there's, um, you know, disappointment. I feel it myself. I feel powerless a lot of the time. Um, I feel like that, you know, the body is, does have its uh, limitations. Mm -hmm. I want to be, and suddenly I'm thinking about ageism because, you know, you're over 70 and suddenly you're, you know, Alice Notley has to go out, you know, she has to have the papers to go out in Paris to, to go do an errand. You have to prove, show who you are. Um, have essential reasons to exist and then meanwhile all these bodies piling up in the nursing homes are expendable etc so the value of life and what is it what does this all mean so if you're a poet you've got to be thinking about this and you've not but 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 also getting inside um which you offer you offer you know you share your mind your consciousness your ideas your visions you are tentacular you're connecting with all these power places and that would be the other thing to connect with the power and the capital that's out there and try to bring another i don't think we can overturn the capital scene world but we've got to get health care you know and people have to pick their battles with that and we have some and we have a difficult time with this election i mean we who knows if we can even vote there's a whole list of all the different voting situations with all the the different states i mean in some places you need to get an application before you can do an absentee ballot people don't even know that yeah. in some situations and you have to prove you know and have an idea i mean it's it's we are so uh we are in such emergency mode in terms of holding on to our, uh, what we have in our humanity. And I, but I think because poets are part of the rhizome, they're more fluid, they can slip, they're more trickster-like, they can work with the shifting uh, mind, points of view, imagination, language, other languages, uh, you know, uh, rally in this way that's um, um, where what, you know, the, it's interesting, the mask, of course, how you're speaking through the mask, speaking your poetry through a mask. I think about that all the time. It used to be the gaze. Mm -hmm. How are we seeing things? What is the, um, you know, the gaze that's, uh, and when somebody dies, you know, I'm seeing things the way Michael McClure might, you know, seeing the, listening to the lion's roar. You know, so that that's what it is, I think, that we have to be in touch with, you know, strip it all down the academies, work with the academies if you can, um, see what, see little uh, uh, ways to help them. Mm -hmm. um, no, it's, I, I'm with you. I think it's so important because people get very attached to their institutionalization. It's not the uh, temporary autonomous zone, it's the institution. And so the institution has to be preserved for his founders and his trustees and the people who make money off it and the, the donations. And we have to build more buildings. Uh, that kind of I, I, I think I can't help, but I'm glad that, you know, that segment, that beautiful segment of film is dedicated to kids' negative capability. Because um, I find Redfield recently uh, in the whole idea of how you transform from darkness into light is exactly what the Renaissance did. Yeah. The dark ages associated with war, savages, and famine, and of course the Black Death is what culminated. Yes, yes. What happened into Florence. I mean, 65% it, of its population were wiped out. Uh, yeah. You're lucky yeah. to have 
uh, Masacho haven't completed the Brancacci chapel, but there's so many artists we love and admire yes. was victim. Mm -hmm. But yep. what did in the next 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, uh, it, it, it all it took it just to reapply classical philosophies, art and literature. Yes. The world renaissance mean rebirth. But yes. we are going through the similar period. So well, how, 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 do you, how do you see this renaissance that can happen? I, I, I just think that being slowed down actually has proven to be our advantage. Yes. The slowness is what it takes to write a poem and read a poem, to make a painting, to view a painting. Yeah. All of that is actually very advantageous to what we do. It's part of our natural humanistic inquiry. Yeah. And that's where the arts and humanity have to come together. It's been marginalized, too much of it being kept in the academy. Mm -hmm. Our job now to mobilize the academy people to bring them out mm -hmm. somehow, to be able to have a dialogue, to share, and particularly to talk to ordinary American, working class American. Yes, good. And I think that's where the late 60s were so affected. Mm -hmm. But then it fell by the 70s, and you mentioned Reagan. Reagan was a master. Yeah. He was the master. He created yeah. all of that incredible, um, I would say, even censorship of censorship. graphic, print, you know, images. No journalist is even allowed to come near the subject. Yeah. We never see horror. You know, we never see violence like we, the way we did in the late 60s or right. early 70s. So it's an odd debate altogether, but uh, thank you for <laughs> Thank you, I wanna continue this conversation. I mean, I want, I, I'm, I've slowed down, I'm a little speedy, but you know, they say the dark time, the Kali Yuga is when things speed up. Yeah. And, they, and there's no chance to even think, you know, you, you're going, you're flick, in this flicker mode. But I, I will work on this with you. And I have, I visit the academies and I get, you know, worried. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madeline. So Thank you. Also, before we go to one final uh, poem from Anne, and thank you so much. Um, I'm just so glad we recorded this because I feel like it became a, a very sort of necessary oral history. Um, so I'm glad we have this preserved. And Kyle, thank you. Thank you for the, all that you do at the Poetry Project, which is just one of the most important places in the city for me and everyone else. And especially amazing how you guys have shifted your programming online. Uh, I urge everyone to check out the Poetry Project's online programming right now. It's fantastic. Um, yeah, and thank you. Lot of, I wanted to say there's a lot of the Jack Kerouac uh, School archive up. So you can find things on archive.org and find old, you know, texts and lectures and that sort of thing, if you're looking for things to listen to. Yes, that will be amazing. Um, yeah, so thank you everyone for coming. We do this 1 p.m. every day, we go live. Tomorrow we have a great conversation scheduled between David Anfam and Ali Bonsidar, which should be great. Right. Um, and then I guess now we'll have Anne read a poem and after Anne finishes, we will unmute everybody in the audience. So then everyone will have a chance to say goodbye and chat. Uh, but okay, Anne, over to you. Okay, this is from Trickster Feminism and it's, um, the coda, sort of last, last line. Sell a soul to the devil, securities, clearance, praise, offerings to hilltops, throw of the dice, werewolves, orishas, papa legba, meet up after dark, trickster down and dirty, trickster in the nunnery, impudent or oblique, trickster in the binary, let's get trickster outside the settlement, evolves, cavorts, hypnotizes, measure of the battle for transforming to indigenous time, post-government time. It was shadows, it was mountains, it was nukes to guide us, assaulting weapons, hatched in trap of mind, floods and jumping. If it was jumping time, was it the way if peace comes at end of fight? There is leaping, cheer, piper pipes a song to hear and you hear it loud and clear. Trickster, pipe this song to me. How much longer will I be covert operation? Bring us down, it was a girl's turn. Put on mask or play dead or inhabit Avenger headset. Quasar laughs inside, loop of science speaks. World's negligence is memory, memory on which existence and truth stand. Post-modernity snag, who is hunting? Who counts years when pen comes to hand? When words outlast 
This bad guy is moot. Heart and throat, beautiful animals dying on us. A sibyl calls out words in another tongue. Are you there? And ladder is let down. Come up now. Come up, climb up to firmament, elusive or decisive when peace is in the clouds with all the immortals. Come into head with no gun in sight. Shake like a bell, recalcitrant body, a warning. When human was a campsite, undesirables turned saints, flurry of carelessness, will all be toxic and in exile, coddled in complicity. Tell me how in devastation adventure continues, droning out for the money laundering protest. Don't be dazed around criminals. Take the wheel of office again. Boycott, stop out, plead, hold peace for the ancient anarchist ghost mothers rocking and fanning themselves. Oh, heckety, heckety, endurance in a dream invaders of a room bred of investigations murky morass same demons in the belfry those who cast out round up incarcerate break bleak soul of those who try to unshackle the rules of subservience but how get supper to homeless shivering at crossroads with keening imagination however jinx how to get to the crossroads, oh trickster. Thank you, Anne. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kyle. Thank you all so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Kyle. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Kyle. You. Thank you. Thank Thank you. 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 Hi, Katarina. I think I'll buy it now for us. Hi, who's Hi. that? Hi, <laughs> Hi, Raymond. Oh, thank thank you, down, no more jumping. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you, Sophia. <laughs> Great to see all your faces. Bye. Much love. Hey, everyone. Much love. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.